the NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work education, work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education, research, and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. On the screen is a link to the webinar series where you can find the webinar schedule, archive of past events, and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can find slides, resources, and recordings for each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. These links are also in the chat. And before we get started, please take a moment to review the Zoom controls on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and cameras off. If you have any questions and comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box and webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring the chat throughout the discussion. As a reminder, participants of, in all NAGT meetings and events are expected to abide by the NAGT code of conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the full NAGT code of conduct policy linked in the chat for details. Today's webinar is titled Getting Started with NASA Data, Mapping Hazards from Space, presented by Cynthia Hall from the NASA Earth Science Data Systems Program. They are going to, or she's going to showcase some of NASA's online resources to help in data access, retrieval, and use, as well as highlight three use cases of data in action regarding sea level change, urban heat islands, and earthquake de deformation. Thank you, Cindy, for participating in the NAGT webinar series. You can go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you for having me. Um, Bradley, is my screen showing now? Yes, it is. Great, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, I'm really excited to be here from NASA's Earth Science Data Systems Program. I am the community coordinator there and work to um, hopefully develop resources that a, a more novice data users um, might find useful in accessing um, the wealth of NASA data that we have available. Um, so NASA's Earth Science Data Systems Program promotes open access for open science. And open data is the foundation of the program whose mission is accelerating scientific advancement for societal benefit. <clears throat> NASA's Earth Observing Data and Information System is responsible for all of NASA's Earth Science collections. And at the end of 2020, we had about 41 petabytes of data making our collections one of the largest on the planet. Um, and while the data are freely available and there are multiple entry points to the data, the sheer number of possible data sets for any given measurement can be quite overwhelming to a novice data user. Um, for example, this is our primary uh, portal for the data, Earth Data Search. And you can see here, there are over 7,500 data collections available. Um, if, even if I filter, let's say I want to filter by sea surface temperature, um, there are still over 400 collections to choose from. And so in, knowing which data set might best meet your needs can be a conundrum. And so to help address some of the, the reported challenges with data access, uh, data selection, and application, our program has developed a series of resources for getting started with NASA data. And today I'd like to share some of those resources with you, as well as provide a few use cases of how these might be used um, in your research setting or in your classroom setting or what have you. So if we look at the Earth Data website and we go to our Learn section, this is where all of our, uh, uh, we have a plethora of resources um, to help you get started with remote sensing data. Um, and just kind of to start, I'll go to our backgrounders. And these provide just what it kind of says, background information on a particular topic. And a two that I want to show you today that might be useful is we've developed what is remote sensing. And basically, this serves as a resource for those new to satellite or airborne observations. And this um, backgrounder provides information on the types of orbits that, are, that NASA uh, sends satellite to, um, the electromagnetic spectrum, the different kinds of sensors that are used, um, the different resolutions. So whether that be uh, thinking about spatial resolution, temporal resolution, 
or spectral resolution. And then lastly, we have information on data processing, interpretation, and analysis. So this is kind of a nice resource to give some background information on remote sensing. Another one that might be of interest and that we're gonna delve kind of into synthetic aperture radar today um, is what is SAR? Um, and this provides information more about active sensors and that is sensors that produce their own energy and then record the amount of energy reflected back after interacting with the earth. And this backgrounder discusses the role of uh, wavelength and frequency. And this is really important. We'll kind of get into this later when you're talking about deformation and um, penetration of vegetation cover and things of that nature. And it also talks about polarization and scattering mechanisms. And then um, interferometry or interferometric SAR, we call that NSAR. And again, we're gonna delve into that a little bit today. And then how you go about getting that data. So again, those are our backgrounders and there are quite a few others, um, but this at least gives you a taste of what information is available on the NASA website. So now that you have some background information, um, let's get started with the data discovery path. Um, so for users who really don't know where to begin with using NASA data, so a more novice data user, we have a series of data pathfinders. And data pathfinders provide direct links to commonly used data sets. Um, so kind of trying to address that conundrum of which data set do I choose. Um, we have pathfinders on a variety of topics, as you can see here. Um, agriculture and water resources, um, biological diversity and ecological forecasting, health and air quality, wildfires, um, and many more. Um, today, however, we're going to focus on uh, three within our disaster series, cyclones, earthquakes and volcanoes, and extreme heat. Um, but before diving in, I want to give you a little bit more background on the pathfinders and kind of what they might offer you and or your students. Um, so I'm going to go to the disasters data pathfinder and in each pathfinder we have a kind of unique um, table if you will um, about the data. Um, this information is not really consolidated on NASA's website anywhere except for in these pathfinders um, but we provide information about every data set within the pathfinder and it provides the measurement taken by the sensor so whether that be um, land surface temperature or sea surface temperature, but then we also provide the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution. And this information is very important when you're determining what data set to use in your research. So whether that um, be knowing the scale at which you need, at which you need data, um, as well as knowing if the data are available in the time frame of interest. So do you need the data daily or do, is it okay that it's every 16 days um, or what have you? The um, use the data section provides information on how the data are currently being used for planning and decision making. It provides real world examples of data in action. The benefits and limitations section provides insight into considerations when determining whether or not to even use remote sensing data. And lastly, each pathfinder has uh, resources section, both from NASA sources as well as outside sources. And for example, when you're looking at uh, disasters, an important site for NASA is our NASA's Applied Sciences Disasters Program, where they produce numerous GIS or Geographic Information System ready data sets, as well as have a disasters dashboard for inter interacting with the data often in near real time. So let's dive further into a specific one, the Cyclones Data Pathfinder. And in this example, we have several sections that provide those direct links to commonly used data sets. Observations when assessing the conditions just prior to an event. So maybe you uh, want to see precipitation data or relative humidity, uh, sea surface temperature, winds, sea level pressure, things of that nature. Or maybe in cyclones, this is very important at looking at near real-time assessment. And this provides data sets, many of those mentioned above, but often available three hours from the satellite overpass. And then lastly, post-storm assessment uh, provides measurements that aid in flood inundation mapping 
um, like surface reflectance or synthetic aperture radar. We also have information about soil moisture, power outages, et cetera. And then lastly, each Pathfinder provides a link to tools for data access and visualization with a brief introduction to each tool within the Pathfinder from Earth Data Search and Worldview, which I'm going to delve into a little bit more today, to other tools created by NASA's Distributed Active Archive Centers or DACs who are responsible for archiving and distributing the data. Just real quick before we go into our use cases, um, if you're a more experienced NASA Earth Science data user, another resource that we have are our toolkits. And toolkits contain links to data sets, tutorials and how to's, feature articles, and data user profiles all in one location. There's a ton of useful information here. But as you can see, there are just direct links to the data sets in Earth Data Search or at one of the DACs. Um, there's no guidance on which data set might be best for your research or on spatial or temporal resolution or anything like that. Um, so this is just if you know where to go to get the data, you can go there directly through these links. And we have toolkits on biological diversity, disasters, freshwater availability, and wildfires. So now I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, a lot of these sites take a little bit of time to load, and so I wanted to have everything ready um, so that we didn't waste time waiting on things to load. So bear with me. But I'd like to look at um, three use cases of maybe how you can use these in your own research or in your teaching environment. And we're going to look at three different use cases with different types of NASA data accessed through three different NASA or partner tools. And as we progress, the data are going to become more complex. So we're going to start out with visualizations and imagery that might be beneficial to an undergraduate classroom, say. And then we're going to move to research quality data. So maybe for yourself or your graduate students or, or upper level undergraduate students. And as we progress, the tools are also going to become more complex. Um, but as they become more complex, they offer more choices for data analysis. And so the first, um, the first use case that I want to look at is sea level change, coastal storms, and flooding. Um, so I'm just going to go to another Pathfinder here real quick. Um, according to the United Nations, and a lot of you probably already know this, 40% um, of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast, meaning that close to 3 billion people could be impacted by changes in sea level. Um, coastal communities are the centers for economic, social, and cultural uh, development, and they also provide numerous ecological and environmental services. And if we look here at some of the information, we're just going to go to global mean sea level so you can see how it's risen over time or increased over time. Um, it's increasing at about 3.3 millimeters per year. And we're already seeing catastrophic effects in coastal communities through flooding, erosion, and storm related hazards. Um, for example, I am based out of Charleston, South Carolina. And our nuisance or our high tide flooding, we have seen increase from about two days per year in 1950. Um, and it's expected to continue increasing to 60 to 75 events per year by 2050, all due to a rising sea level. And this can completely shut down our downtown area. So it can have definite impacts on um, transportation, tourism, work, things of that nature. In addition, as we all know, 2020 saw an unprecedented uh, hurricane season with 30 named storms. And when you couple sea level rise with intense hurricanes, uh, obviously the outcome is catastrophic. So let's explore this topic from the perspective of introductory students. And we want them to at least get to play with some data um, through visualizations and imagery. Um, so just to give you an idea, we have data pathfinders um, for sea level change, cyclones, and flooding. A lot of them have some of the same information, obviously, but each of them also provide a unique, they also provide unique information to that specific area of study. For example, you can see here with sea level change, um, we students could delve into um, 
ice mass changes, ice height and thickness, um, sea surface temperature or sea surface height data. And we even go into vertical land motion here in Charleston, we're undergoing subsidence as is uh, the New Orleans area, just natural subsidence. And so looking at that maybe with some SAR data. And the list as you see here goes on. Um, flooding provides data and inf information on contributing factors to flood events and then resources for flood inundation mapping. And then as we already saw with cyclones, um, that also provides measurements on that provide insight into cyclone formation and assessing impacts. And just so you know, all of the all of the disaster series have access to socioeconomic data as well, so that users can readily assess a community's vulnerability, exposure, and risk to a natural hazard. So in thinking about, I have a question for you all, in thinking about sea level change, cyclones, and flooding, what are some questions that you might have your students think about? And if you'll just kind of put those in the chat, um, I'm gonna go ahead and go with some questions that I came up with just for time purposes. But what I would like to do is we are saving the chat and a lot of our website and kind of where we're going with things are based on these use cases. And I would love to generate, take your questions and figure out how that could be used in uh, different settings and make that more applicable on the NASA website. Um, so please, what are your, definitely throw out some questions that um, you would have your students think about. And so a few that I came up with are, what is, how is the development of a hurricane affected by sea surface temperature and other things? Um, what patterns do we see in sea surface temperature data over time and how may that have an impact on the intensity of hurricanes? And then how do hurricanes impact surrounding areas with winds and flooding? So if I go to my cyclones data pathfinder, I could integrate this into maybe a classroom setting. And maybe I want my students to look at sea surface temperature. And for a more, I wanna keep this as basic as possible, right? Since I'm maybe dealing with introductory students that are not majoring in the geosciences. Um, however, I want them to interact with some data through visualizations. Then we have a tool here at NASA called WorldView. And you can see that the, there are direct links to that in here. But just to kind of show you what WorldView looks like, and we're gonna play around with this a little bit. Um, WorldView is a visualization application that provides the capability to interactively browse full resolution satellite imagery layers. And then the, you, could, you can actually underline the, downline, the underlying data if you needed to. Um, many, many of the imagery layers are available within three hours of observation, essentially showing the entire Earth as it looks right now. Now, when you get here, there are some stories that are already um, developed by the WorldView team, and they guide you through a process of how you could use NASA data sets, similarly to what I'm doing today. Um, for example, here's one on Hurricane Dorian. But as you can say, see, today is February 23rd, and as the data become available, so again, about three hours after observation, um, they are added into WorldView. And this, this is really cool because it supports time critical application areas. Um, and I can zoom in and look at different features or what have you. I can add layers via hazards and disasters, or I can go by science discipline, or I can just do a general search. WorldView also allows you to create animations. So when we're talking about sea surface temperature, maybe that's a cool thing to have students um, kind of work through an animation of what sea surface temperature look like over time. And then lastly, you can do aerial measurements um, and distance measurements. However, something to keep in mind is that these are visualizations of the data. Um, if, and they are not, processed with the latest and greatest ephemeral and calibration data or information. Um, so they are not to be used in more research-based studies. Again, just visualizations of the data, but supporting time critical. So when da data latency is a concern, this is where you might want to look. Okay, so if I go back to my data pathfinder and we, I wanna look at sea surface temperature to kind of help my students um, or have my students evaluate some of these questions I asked earlier. Um, 
there are a couple of different options here. I'm going to go to a Muir SST data and worldview. And Muir just stands for a multi-scale ultra high resolution. And I just it's described above so um, the students would know what that was. And here I am looking at that data set um, in worldview. Uh, now I have also started a comparison um, because I want to look at two specific years. Um, and so I'm looking at September of 2018, which is on this A side over here, and September 2008 on the B side. And so if you'll notice, whatever layer I'm in over here with my, um, my legend, it'll tell me what the temperatures are. So in 2008, I'm looking at 28, 27, um, think about 28 degrees. But then if I kind of switch over to 2018, you can automatically see a difference. Um, but looking at two, I'm talking about more of like 29 degrees Celsius in 2018. So maybe then the students uh, kind of come up with a hypothesis that the oceans are warming over time. And then if, you know, maybe having them do an animation of that. So the next question is, how does sea surface temperature affect hurricanes? And we all know that uh, warm ocean waters fuel hurricanes. And kind of the prime example I think of that is Hurricane Katrina. Um, so I've opened up uh, another worldview application that also has sea surface temperature data. Um, if you'll notice here, now I'm not in 2018 anymore. I'm in August of 2005. Um, we can see Hurricane Katrina here and we can see the Gulf of Mexico here. So in looking at the temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico in August 2005, we see that they're about 30 degrees Celsius. Well, I, I don't know what the average temperatures in the Gulf are. So I, we also have another data set that is sea surface, sea surface temperature anomalies. Um, so we're checking that out now, and this is, uh, the difference in that month compared to a longer term average. And if you look here, some of these are um, about a degree above normal. Um, so the, the Gulf was definitely warm uh, that, that, that month. So let's watch as the storm approaches, and I'm just gonna turn off my layers here. I'm gonna progress through time. And what, what you'll notice happen is as the, as the storm hits those warmer than normal waters, it grows in size. Because if you remember, Hurricane Katrina did not start off as a um, large storm, and then it actually dissipated a bit as it went over Florida. Um, but as soon as it hits those warm uh, currents in the Gulf of Mexico, um, it starts to become a much more defined storm. And you can actually see the eye wall there. And then we can actually turn on our place labels too and see the diameter of this storm um, was covered multiple states from Louisiana all the way uh, to Georgia almost. Um, and if you'll recall, this storm ended up having devastating impacts on New Orleans and the surrounding areas. And so from this, maybe your students can hypothesize that warmer than normal waters can increase the intensity of a storm. Um, so let's evaluate that a little bit further, and we're going to look at Hurricane Florence, which hit North Carolina in September of 2018. And I'm going to turn on, I'm going to step through just so you see the storm. Um, so here we are. I've also got this, uh, I've got a comparison going here. Um, so right now we are looking at September 8th. And you can see the storm off uh, out here a bit. And then as we start to progress, it starts to really form. And we'll keep going. And until it hits the North Carolina coastline. Well, let's see what my, let's turn on my sea surface temperature anomalies for um, this time period. And we can actually see with this data set that places in the Atlantic were over three degrees Celsius above normal in September 2018. So if my students are thinking warmer water, waters fuel the storm, um, you know, it, it wasn't a very large storm, 
but it did have some devastating impacts in North Carolina. And we do see it intensify as it moves over the Atlantic uh, and so forth. Um, now I'm gonna turn over just to kind of give you some ideas of what other data sets are here. Um, this is a wind surface data set and it's from the satellite Cygnus and it's ocean surface wind, sp wind speed. And you can see out here, and these are just the tracks of the data uh, where data were collected. Um, but you can actually see that we get some areas where uh, it's about, you know, 18 meters per second, which is around 40 miles per hour, I believe. Um, but if we, as we approach the shore, we start to see those wind speeds go up. And this is due to a variety of factors. Um, but what, what I think is really cool about this data set is that you can, with this wind data set, you can see the quadrants of the storm. Um, so we know the top right part of the storm is the most dangerous with high winds. And because of that uh, counterclockwise rotation, pushing uh, water on shore um, with higher storm surges. Um, we also know that the bottom right quadrant of the storm is also known for high wind speeds, and you can see that here. And again, this was only a category one storm. Um, so now I want to, I'm going to turn off winds and just turn on my sea surface temperature data. In both, both uh, dates, and I'm going to step back in time here to um, the 8th, so we can kind of watch as it approaches. Um, and see kind of what happens and what patterns we might see um, after Hurricane Florence kind of, you know, moves on shore. And this is a really cool uh, thing to, to kind of see is that as you progress in time, you can actually see the path of the storm. So the storm is making landfall right here. And we can see that um, it is actually indeed soaking up or absorbing this warm ocean water and letting it fuel the storm and therefore leaving a cold wake behind. And you can actually, that cold wake, there's some temperatures in here of like 26 degrees, whereas the surrounding, we're still talking 29-ish. Um, so that's a cool feature, this comparison feature to look at some of those aspects. Um, so kind of looking at another question, how does flooding impact the different spheres within the Earth system? And here I'm looking at another data set that we have, same time period. I'm looking at September of 2018. Um, here's Hurricane Florence. And this is soil moisture, so surface soil moisture from the Soil Moisture Active Passive mission. And what the students, one of these dates is the 11th, just prior to the storm hitting. And then here it is making landfall and doing the comparison, we can really see the change in soil moisture and kind of maybe have some hypothesis of what is going to what this is going to lead to um, from a flooding standpoint. And then we have to look at flooding. So no, another interesting feature within worldview is that we have different band combinations for several of the surface reflectance sens sensors. And so what I'm looking here is a specific band combination that actually highlights burn scars from fires or flood inundation events. And in this layer, and here I'm looking at August 30th, so just prior to the storm, um, what I'll notice is that after the storm, liquid water on the ground should appear very dark since it absorbs in these specific bands, so the red band and the shortwave infrared. And actually I can see that here, and you can kind of clearly define that now these are kind of inundated with water, they're appearing darker, and we can maybe even map some flood inundation from, um, you know, very coarse level flood inundation event. Um, lastly, I mentioned socioeconomic data, and we can actually look and worldview at population data um, and see which areas might be uh, prone to or, or more vulnerable um, to this hazard. And there are other types of data, like this is a flood hazard mortality risk. Um, and if you wanted to find out information, um, there's information on what that data set means, um, when the data were collected, and that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of the first um, use case that I wanted to go through. And does anyone have any questions at, just with what we've gone through so far before I move into the second use case? 
I was getting a little bit confused at how you were getting to those different maps. I actually went over to the app and then all I got found was like downloading data, not app, I'm sorry, the, the website. I don't, I don't know how you're getting to see different things that you were looking at. So um, in the data pathfinders, these links should take you directly to that. I already had them open because it can take a while for the data sets to load. Um, but for example, if I wanted to look at that, um, that multi, the, the multi-scale ultra high resolution data set and worldview, if I click on this from the data pathfinder, it automatically takes me to that information with that particular data set loaded. Or if you just go to the WorldView app, you can also add layers. Um, like if I wanted to add the anomaly, um, I might look at sea surface temperature, and then here is my anomaly data set. Um, and I can add that in that way as well. I guess I was looking at a polarized one and I couldn't figure out how to, anyway. Yeah, okay. Does that help? The, the do you what I want to emphasize is that the data pathfinders are really a, a great resource to get directly to these data sets um, so that you don't have to spend time kind of searching um, for where you might access them. Any other questions? Thank you for that. Yeah, there's one other question asking if there are any um, tutorial videos for how to use this. Yes, definitely. Um, we have, uh, and I believe they're on the, I believe I gave them to the NAGT team um, to put on the website, um, but we do have some webinars on um, how you go about using the data pathfinders, how you go about using WorldView, and those are all on our uh, website. And just, I'll just show you real quick. We have, if you go to the learn section, we have webinars and tutorials, and we actually have an Earth Data YouTube site and if you go to that YouTube site, um, it will take you to some of these resources. Any other questions? Well, thank you for those, those were great. I'd like to move now to the uh, second use case, and this is on um, urban heat islands. And we do have an extreme heat data pathfinder under the disasters area. And so according to the United States Global Change Research Program, heat waves are occurring more frequently in major cities across the nation. Um, heat waves are actually periods of abnormally hot and or humid weather lasting a few days to uh, weeks at a time. And just to give you some kind of statistics, in the 1960s, major cities in the U.S. experienced on average about two heat, heat waves per year. And in the 2010s, that number rose to more than six heat waves per year. And urban heat islands play a big role in these extreme heat events. As you all know, cities tend to have higher temperatures than the outlying more rural areas. And this is due primarily with the differences in radiative and thermal properties of varying surfaces, um, especially when looking at impervious surfaces like um, concrete, buildings, uh, other types of infrastructure, pavement. Um, and then also we have to think about the spatial distribution of water and soils and vegetation. Um, and so all these kind of play into understanding it. And NASA has data related to all of these. So as you can see here, um, we have land cover data um, as well as the temperature and humidity. And so one of the things we're gonna think about here is in monitoring heat waves, it's important to access, access long-term data records to uh, uh, assess abnorm abnormalities um, and using remote remote sensing data can be um, an asset in determining climate trends as several of these satellite platforms have been acquiring data over many years. Um, for example, the Terra satellite, unfortunately it's about to end its life, lifetime, but it's in, uh, been acquiring data since the year 2000. So when you start to talk about 20 years worth of data, that's a really nice consistent and continuous data coverage. And so we can, we can have reliable temperature and humidity anomaly um, maps. So now I want to explore this topic and this use case from the per perspective of maybe introducing students to data. Um, not just visual, we are going to look at some visualizations of the data, but having them ac actually um, do some processing and analysis of the data. And we're going to use a, a little bit more complex tool. Um, it's fairly user friendly. It does say, take some time getting used to. 
Um, but in each of our data pathfinders, so I'm just gonna go to temperature data here. We kind of have three different levels just as we're walking through today. So we have down here, we have worldview, which is kind of like a basic, again, data visualization. Um, we have this tool called Giovanni, which is what we're going to next, which allows you to do some kind of basic analysis. And then here we have research quality data. So I'd like to focus um, next on this tool and it's from NASA's Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center or GESDIS and it's called Giovanni and it provides access to data products that can be visualized as a time averaged map and animation, seasonal maps, um, scatter plots and things of that nature and it's all online. So it's all kind of working um, in the cloud so to speak. So in thinking about urban heat islands, what are some questions that you might have your students think about? And again, put those in the chat. I'd love to see what questions, you know, again, you're getting your classrooms to think about. A couple that I came up with were, um, what is the role of urban heat islands in Earth's energy balance? Um, how has human activity led to the cre creation of urban heat islands? And then again, looking at anomaly maps to see how things have changed over time. So what I want to do in my data pathfinder, I'm in air surface temperature. And with this per particular scenario, I want to go to Giovanni. So I know I'm gonna go to this area here and I'm gonna look at temperature at the surface. And instead of going to, I'm, I'm gonna pick this Mira 2. And again, information is provided on these. Um, I'm gonna pick the Mira 2 uh, data set because it actually, is not um, it's a it's a reanalysis data set which means it's an assimil assimilation of lots of space-based observations and a lot of these reanalysis also bring in in situ measurements to make them a really um, strong data set um, and again this one goes back to 1980 so I can get 40 years worth of data here um, it's, it's important to note while we're here that not all data sets are in Giovanni only the ones that are um, that they have kind of imported in here. Um, so again, it's not available for every data set, um, but it, and it also requires an earth data log user login. And you'll see that I'm logged in here. You, you can get some basic functionality without being logged in, but the, you get so much more by being logged in and the earth data login is free and available to anyone. Um, so well worth it if you're going to kind of incorporate NASA data. Um, so I mentioned time average maps, but also seasonal maps. And I know I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna look at a particular area. So maybe there was an extreme heat event um, over Canada in August of 2020. Um, so I'll kind of wanna look and see if that indeed was the case. So I know I want a monthly uh, averaged map and I select that. Um, I did not select my data set at that moment and I should have, so bear with me real quick. Um, but we know we want surface air temperature. And as you can see, this takes a while, but I can also um, look at uh, different dates. So again, I know I want 2020 data. And I'm just gonna get the average for the month of August right now. Again, you can see how why I loaded this before. <laughs> I'm gonna look at surface air temperature here. So I'm gonna select that data set. Um, again, you can see it's monthly data averaged um, 1980 to 2020. And I can also change from Kelvin to Celsius. Um, I can specify my month. So I wanted to look at August. And I have actually already chosen Canada. So you can do a bounding box here or you can, we have a series of shape files that are in here. Um, and I, again, just typed on Canada and it popped right up. Um, and then that's where I'm gonna get access to the data. Um, from doing that, I can just do um, plot data. And I've already plotted this because again, it takes um, a bit of time to do this. Um, but here is my August 2020 uh, air surface temperature. And it automatically does a palette for you, which you can change here under options. Um, and also I can download my uh, data in a GeoTIFF format, um, which is what I'm gonna do because I actually wanna make my anomaly map in a different program. So this, this Giovanni will not make the anomaly map for you, 
But if you download the time average maps, you can generate your own anomaly map. And so I'm going to download them as a GeoTIFF. Well, I need to go back and get my long-term average. So I'm going to switch this now to 1980. And now I have 1980 to 2020. And I'm again, that's my long-term data record. I'm going to um, plot data, go to my results. And here you can see I have August months averaged over that time period. Again, I'll download this as a GeoTIFF. And once you have the files downloaded, so this is an easy way to get these time average maps. And once you have the files downloaded, you can open them in a GIS program. I'm specifically using QGIS, which is a free GIS program. Um, but NASA also has a program called Panoply. Um, both of these will take the difference of values between two raster files, creating an anomaly map. So I'm just going to, I've already downloaded these. Um, if I wanted, I'm in Q just now, and this is how it would, it would look like. I'm not going to be able to teach you QGIS, but um, it's pretty, there are lots of tutorials on how to use it. But I know I want to open my data source. And so I'm going to open, there are a bunch of different options here. I want to select raster since I'm dealing with a GeoTIFF. Here's my August 2020 data. And I'm just going to add that. And here it appears in the um, QGIS program, but it's in grayscale. Um, again, I don't have time to go over this, but you can come in the symbology and change the color scheme. There are a ton of different palettes to use um, and change that and apply it and then come to something more like this. Again, so these are my temperatures. Um, I can, I'm, this is actually, there are data behind these visualizations. And here I also have my 1980 to 2020 put in here. And, you know, just looking at this real quickly, we, and turning them off and on, from the long-term average, we can see kind of a northern trend up here of warming. We also see some warming over here and a little bit of warming up here. Um, so now to, that's my just kind of looking at the data and making some interpretations. But in QGIS, this is really cool. You can actually use a raster calculator. And um, now normally you wouldn't have this anomaly map. I've already generated it. But with anomaly maps, we can take the uh, anomaly value for that particular month and take the difference from the long-term average over many years. Put in our uh, output layer, click OK. So again, we're taking the difference of these two. And what we end up with is something like this. And I have changed the symbology and I have changed the scale over here. So our dark red areas are about four degrees Celsius above normal, above that 40 year average. And um, we don't have any of the really dark blue, which is the negative four. Um, but there are lots in, in the uh, two degrees Celsius warmer, as well as uh, some areas of cooling. So again, I'm really interacting with the data here and doing a little bit more processing, um, but I am able to uh, create this anomaly map um, pretty quickly and can make some assumptions based on that. So now I'd like to, um, that's use case two, um, and take any, are there any questions with what I've been through so far? And I know I'm going through some of these tools quickly, um, but are there any questions so far? Yeah, there, there are a few questions. So okay. um, a couple of people have been asking, so is there a glossary or index for the names and abbreviations for these different types of data? Um, Yes, um, we have a glossary on our website because, you know, NASA is notorious for acronyms, right? And so everything has an acronym within the about the data section of the data pathfinders. Um, they're actually written out and then the acronyms provided as well. Um, so that's actually where I encourage people to start um, because, again, it tells you what the measurement is. So land surface temperature or air surface temperature, and then also that spatial and temporal resolution. And then you can go from there knowing um, what sensor provides that data set that you need. Is this data under copyright? 
Um, no, this data, are they're all free and openly available to anyone. That's NASA's open data policy. And so anyone can access this and, um, you know, do whatever research they need to do with it. Can you export any of this data from the visualizations themselves? Yeah, so you'll notice with Giovanni, I just, I was able to download as a, GI, a GeoTIFF. Um, Worldview also lets you do, um, I don't have Worldview open right now, but it also lets you do kind of a screen capture, which saves it as an image file, um, something like a ping or a JPEG, um, which is why you, you have to go to a separate tool to actually get to the actual data. Whereas Giovanni here does let you get to the data through downloading of, of a GeoTIFF. I think just one more while we're here. Um, do you have, um, are there any activities that you've created that people could adapt to use in their own classrooms, things similar to what we've been going through today or? Um, so not, um, not per se, we're not really, um, we're a communications team. And so we don't, we don't have any curricula or anything like that to go along with these. Um, but there are, again, on Worldview, there are, you know, those stories, which would kind of give a, you maybe a starting place. They're data stories, basically. Um, but uh, unfortunately not. Um, I would love to see some created around some of this. Um, but, yeah. Is that it? Yes, that's all okay. that we have so far. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to keep going then um, with our third scenario. And I'm going to go to earthquakes and volcanoes and the use of synthetic aperture radar. And while earthquakes are only the third most common disaster, they kill the greatest number of people. And so it's very important to do what we can to mitigate risk by understanding fault activity, the, the likelihood of an earthquake, and then obviously that population vulnerability exposure and risk um, so that we can aid in response and relief efforts. So this area, we are gonna explore more from the perspective of a more advanced undergraduate or graduate student or a researcher themselves. Um, maybe this uh, individual wants to explore the use of synthetic aperture radar and monitoring the deformation in a specific region. So the Earthquakes and Volcanoes Data Pathfinder provides several resources that could, that could help or that could be useful in impacts after the event. Um, but also you can see here are products that can be used in disaster response. Um, so let's, let's quickly just real quickly look at disaster response because I think this is a neat program that NASA has going on. Um, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, specifically the Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis, another acronym, ARIA, um, for major events, so not for every event, but for major events, they produce maps that can be used right away by whomever. Um, so we're here at their site, and you'll notice it's not just earthquakes, but there are volcanic eruptions here, there are floods and cyclones, and kind of the list goes on. Um, let's say I want to look at the Puerto Rico earthquake that happened in 2020 or earlier last year. And you'll notice there are two different folders. So they have what we call damage proxy maps or DPMs, and then they have displacement maps. And both products are using uh, European Space Agency Sentinel-1 data, um, which is where our SAR data is coming from now. What's exciting, however, is that sometime in 2022, we hope that'll may remain, but um, our dates are always tentative with mission launch. A joint satellite from NASA and the Indian Space Agency, ISRO, will provide SAR data globally on the order of every 12 days. And that's what Sentinel is doing now. But the cool thing about NISAR is that, well, with all SAR, the cool thing about it is it can see through clouds and darkness as it's an active sensor. So it's um, kind of pulsating its own energy source. Um, and so with that in mind, depending on the wavelength of the sensor, we're able to do different things, as I mentioned before. And with NISAR, we're going to have a longer wavelength, um, so specifically um, L-band. 
And this actually can also penetrate vegetation cover. So we can really, not only are we seeing through clouds and darkness, but we're penetrating vegetation cover. And this can be used in land use change, flood inundation mapping, and deformation from earthquakes, volcanoes, and landslides. And that it's really going to transform how we respond to some of these issues. So it's an exciting mission to keep up with. Um, so quickly, the damage proxy maps are provided in, a, in numerous formats. You can see shape files. So we have some GIS ready ones. Um, then there's some KMZ files. I'm just going to open um, this ping file though, just to show you what they look like. Um, and what they did is they took, it's using SAR interferometry. Um, I don't have a lot of time, or th this, this product is looking at pre-event and post-event. This is not interferometry, excuse me. Looking at pre-event and post-event, and then assessing areas that have changed, primarily related to infrastructure, and so where they're damaged, er highly damaged areas. And these are actually being used in emergency management relief efforts, um, knowing where we need to go to provide the most critical services first. They also have uh, displacement maps. And I'm just going to uh, uh, go to one down here. And these are using SAR interferometry. Um, and I, again, I don't have to I don't have time to go into the process in detail. We do have some tutorials on um, interferometry. Um, but basically, it's when two observations are made from the same location in space, but at different times. And the interferometric phase is directly proportional to any change in the range of a surface feature. And this change in phase allows for the measurement of displacement or ground deformation that occurred between the time of the two observations. So again, you want a pre-event and a post-event. And so NSAR, and that's what we call this interferometric SAR, provides centimeter level measurements of displacement from earthquake ruptures. And that's what we're seeing here. So again, this is a displacement map. You can see the USGS epicenters. Um, these areas of red down here um, had almost 16 centimeters of displacement during that earthquake from earlier last year. So, but say your students, th this is great, but maybe they wanna look at an earthquake that there are no data like this provided by that group. They want to make an interferogram and compare it with other types of data for research that maybe they're going to publish at a geology conference. So perhaps they're specifically interested in the Kumamoto earthquake, whose 6.5 magnitude and 6.5 magnitude foreshock and seven magnitude main shock devastated large areas around Kumamoto, Japan, in April of 2016. And so our data pathfinders can get you to the research quality data as well. So if we go to post event assessment data, um, there are a couple of different methods for accessing research quality data. So Earth Data Search, here I have Sentinel 1A and Sentinel 1B SAR data from Earth Data Search. If I click on that link, I'm ta taken here to, um, to Earth Data Search, which is the main portal. Um, we can also go through one of the DACs, which I'm going to show you as well. But Earth Data Search is a, a tool for data discovery of NASA's Earth observation data collections. And users can search for and read about data collections. Um, the Pathfinder directly takes them to the Sentinel-1 data. However, I can also type in a search word here. I can filter by a variety of different factors. I can even filter by um, date. And also I can specify a specific bounding box of where I want to look. So for example, I know I'm interested in Japan and you'll notice that there are about a million granules right now, um, but by filtering on this area, I dropped down to 5,000 and by filtering more on time, I continue to um, get to the data that I actually need. Um, and the Sentinel-1 data is provided through an international partnership with the European Space Agency. We're allowed to distribute data from their satellite. Um, and often in Earth Data Search, you will also get the near real-time collections, but do not forget that near real-time are not processed with the latest ephemeris and calibration information and so sh should not be used for research. If I go back to my Pathfinder, there's another option to search here through Vertex. And Vertex is actually based out of the Alaska Satellite Facility DAC. 
and they specialize in SAR data. So they have a few more options, which is why we're gonna use that particular link. So I've already linked here to that. Um, this is Vertex and I'm looking at Sentinel-1 data. I've already specified the time period that I'm looking for. So April, 2016, and I filtered on that. Um, I can also filter by bounding box to ensure that I'm just getting what I need. Um, so there I've selected Japan and it is um, now filtering to that time period and that specific area. What I like about Vertex is that right now they produce radiometric terrain correction products on demand. Um, and that's a really neat feature. It takes out some of the processing steps for you. And later this year, they're going to be producing on demand NSAR products from this site. So again, um, depending on how much processing you're wanting to do, um, they are doing a lot of that for you and providing those products so we can have um, maybe a quicker turnaround with our science. In the, mean, in the meantime, we just searched on that. Um, I have already downloaded the ones that I need, um, but what again, what I like about this is that you can actually um, have a, a browse so you can see where you're looking. It shows you up here in the bounding box exactly where you're looking, and you can see if that looks like a, a good option for you. Um, you'll also notice that two types of files are provided here, GRD and SLC. Um, GRD are ground drain detected and SLC are single look complex. And again, all of this is in the Pathfinder. Um, single look complex is what you need to actually do the work and to, to make an interferogram. Um, so, okay, so now I've downloaded my files, let's say, and I don't know how to process this data. Well, I can go to the tools for data access and visualization and the European Space Agency has a Sentinel toolbox and this actually walks you through the process of processing this imagery. And so here's the Sentinel toolbox, it's called SNAP. And within SNAP, um, I've actually already loaded my file and it's important to note you want to open your zip file. You want to leave it as a zip because that's what SNAP needs to open. There are a couple of different options here. Um, I, again, I don't have time to go into what those options are but you would want to, to kind of visualize their three swaths here of data and you can open each one and see which swath is over the area of uh, interest specifically. Um, here is one of those swaths, this is IW2 and I'm actually looking at the intensity map. And, but within this program, in order to get to an interferogram, you have to co-register the images and then create the interferogram. And I am almost done here, I promise. Through this, um, flow, the tool tries to eliminate sources of error um, so that you get the most accurate, especially when you're talking centimeters of deformation. Um, so if I do that, and I, again, the, the tutorial will tell you how to walk through the process. I can open the phase here, and here's what I'm left with. And um, interferometric fringes, so this color cycle, um, represents the range difference of half of a sensor's wavelength. So C-band, which is what um, the European Space Agency Sentinel-1 data is 5.6 centimeters. And so each fringe or each color cycle would represent about 2.8 centimeters of displacement. So we can look at, um, we can kind of get to that more deformation. Um, I still, this one still has associated topography. So I have to remove that topography and I've already done that. And here's what you end up with. Now to create an actual deformation map, um, there are some other steps, but that requires a Linux system. And so I do not have that. So instead I've geocoded this so that I can then open it in my um, GIS program. And here I have, um, that is loading, um, that's an amplitude, but I also have my interferogram and actually I have my faults loaded here and I can see this fault right here is actually definitely where I had the most deformation. Um, so with each of these use cases, the data pathfinders can be integrated into course materials to provide students with background information on a particular topic, the NASA satellite observation, and then provide students with direct access to the data. 
and I know I've, I ran to my end time and I apologize about that, but if there are any questions, I would love to take them. Awesome, thank you, Cindy. I'm gonna stop sharing, yeah. Okay, yeah, um, if anyone has any questions or if, Cindy, you have time to field questions that may come in afterwards, um, we can do yeah. that. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Please, if you have some time, take a moment to um, check out our um, end of webinar survey, which I will send out in an email afterwards as well. And um, our next, webinar is on improving statistical skills through storytelling. So um, that information is also going to be on the NAGT webinar page. So if you guys have questions, um, stick around. If not, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much.